Oh yeah, games to play. Let's see. Multiplication puzzles by MECC. Addition Logician by MECC. Money Works by MECC. Hey, wait a second. I'm a computer. I don't need money. Woo! Number Lunches by MECC. I know that one. Miss Fox! I wonder why you have all these discs from MECC. Well, Mackie, today we're going to talk about Mech, one of the most prolific edutainment software publishers throughout the 80s and 90s. You probably know them for being the company behind Oregon Trail and the Muncher series of games. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember now. This is part two of our Apple in School series, the history of MECC. Oh wait, before we get started, is it MECC or is it Mech? I'm pretty sure I've heard it both ways. While MECC does stand for the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, a lot of people, including the CEO of MEC in the 90s, pronounce it as MEC. Chart, and it provides an impetus for us to say, which we now say, MEC for the love of learning. So from here on, we'll just say MEC. Okay, MEC it is. MEC, MEC, MEC. So how did MEC start? Was it like Apple, and they just made games as a hobby in their house? No, Mech didn't start in a house like Apple. To start our history of Mech, let's travel back to the late 1960s in Minnesota, before Apple or any other desktop computer even existed. <gasps> before computers? At the time, Minnesota was ahead of the technological curve. It served as a Midwestern tech hub for large electronic and computer companies, like Control Data Corporation, Who? IBM, <gasps> and Honeywell. Uh, okay. As these companies expanded into industrial sectors, they also saw a way to expand into the world of consumer products. One of the best ways they saw to do this was to develop devices and software for education. Those Minnesotans sure knew computers put the cool in school. They definitely did. The founders of Mech all started at the University of Minnesota College of Education's Mathematics Department. They included Dale LaFrenz, David C. Johnson, Pam Katzman, John Walther, Tom Curran, and Larry Hatfield. In 1968, these six were convinced that computers were going to be a key part in the future of education and wanted to provide computer access to all children. Wait a sec. How much you said this was before computers? How did Mech know they'd be the future if they hadn't even been invented yet? Actually, computers were already invented. Technically, they were so massive that they would take about an entire room or even a whole floor of a building. Wow. Wait, if these computers were so big, where did the school put them? Weren't they also, like, super expensive? Seems like it'd be a lot easier just to share one. Sort of like, uh, well, a library. You do bring up a good point, Mackie. Computers were indeed large, expensive, and required their own rooms. In the early 60s, it wasn't practical for each school to have their own computer. Luckily, a little before the University of Minnesota got into the computer business, Dartmouth University already had computers accessible to their students, using what they called a timeshare system. Mech liked the idea and wanted to start a program of their own. Timesharing? My uncle got tricked one time into buying a timeshare. Turned out to be a beach condo he could only go to in the mythical month of Smarch. I gotta tell you, that weather in Smarch is lousy. Well, it was a similar concept, but it worked a lot differently than visiting a condo. Timeshare computing worked by using a terminal to dial into a centralized mainframe using a telephone connection. In this case, the terminals were something called a teletype machine. <gasps> Did it have emojis? No emojis yet, Mackie. The teletype machine was used prior to the widespread adoption of computer monitors. These machines were essentially electronic typewriters that would bring an output of a mainframe and print it on a sheet of paper. They also had keyboards that could send commands back and forth to the mainframe. Schools were given a time slot that they could use to dial in and use the mainframe for about an hour or two. Then once your time was up, it was another school's turn. No screens? Printing stuff on paper? Wow, this really was ancient times. Did the typewriter use dinosaur bones too? 
No, Mackie. They didn't need dinosaur bones. <laughs> well, through the efforts of the University of Minnesota, schools in Minnesota had begun to purchase and install teletypes and acoustic couplers, which were essentially telephones for computers, so that teachers could start teaching the basic programming language to their students. The teachers thought that learning basic would build problem solving and mathematics skills. As timeshare computing caught on, a program called TIES, or Total Information for Education Systems, was formed in 1968. The University of Minnesota managed the project with 20 other local school districts. The TIES initiative had three functions. One was to set up and support the hardware for timesharing services. Two was to train the teachers on how to use the timesharing services. Three is to develop courseware, and courseware was the software and teaching materials used by teachers to incorporate the technology into their lesson plans. Wait a sec, Miss Fox, I'm a little confused. There's a ties, and then there's some basic courseware. Wait, was it just to teach basic? Or was it something else? Well, Mackie. The TIES group realized that there was more to computing than just teaching students how to program. TIES made an effort to branch out to all subjects, including science, history, and social studies, not just mathematics. So how does all this TIES stuff, uh, uh, tie into the next story? Wink, 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 know what I mean? <laughs> well, the TIES system proved to be successful and the time-sharing system became the cutting-edge form of education. Teachers knew that incorporating computers into all subjects would help the next generation become computer literate as a whole. Outside of the TIES program, other school districts in Minnesota started to clamor for access to this new form of education. Due to this demand, the state of Minnesota formed the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, aka MECC in 1973. MEC broadened the reach of ties to include the entire state university system, the community college system, and the Minnesota Department of Education, representing about 435 school districts. Whoa! 435 school districts! It was a massive expansion to the ties program. The first initiative of MEC was to set up a centralized time-sharing system for Minnesota. To do this, they issued a public notice to computer manufacturers that they were looking for a 435-port time-sharing system. A mainframe of this size would be the largest mainframe time-sharing computer in the world. It's too bad Apple didn't make mainframes back then. That would have been the obvious choice from the start. MEC ended up leasing the Univac 110 for $7 million. This machine was massive. It needed its own industrial cooling system and took up a whole room to house all the equipment. And unfortunately for Univac and MEC, the Univac 110 wasn't created to serve 435 users at once. Univac ended up sending 20 engineers to MEC to shoehorn the U110 system into accommodating what MEC needed. <gasps> oh no! What happened to the Univac? Did they end up having to buy a new computer? I bet it was a Mac! The Univac engineers were able to shoehorn the U110 to work with 400 users. However, there was a 4 second delay in typing at the teletype and then receiving a response back from the mainframe. Whoa! Talk about a major lag! That's like me saying, Hey Miss Fox! And you're like, This is not going to work, huh? <laughs> well, eventually, Met contacted a fellow Minnesotan company, Control Data Corporation, or CDC, about their Cyber 73 mainframes. These computers were able to handle a larger number of users. So in 1977, Met and CDC installed a colossal Cyber 73 system, bringing a reliable and fast mainframe to Minnesota. Ooh, neato! So Mech and CDC lived happily ever after. Wait a minute. You said, you said this is 1977? <gasps> That's the time Apple II came out! It was, Mackie. In 1977, 
The world of desktop computers was born. Max sent an instructional coordinator, a teacher teacher, to the West Coast Computer Fair of 1977. Oh yeah, I remember the computer fair from last lesson. Cue that beautiful disco music. I think this is going to be a little distracting, Mackie. Oops, sorry. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak introduced the Apple II at the 1977 West Coast Computer Fair. It was a compact, elegant machine that promised to be easy to learn and easy to use, much easier than the CDC mainframe system, and it even offered a color monitor. Mech knew that this machine was going to replace mainframes and terminal systems, but unfortunately for Mech, they had just entered into a five-year contract with CDC. Aww. Can't ride the Apple train just yet, I suppose. Soon after the 1977 West Coast Computer Fair, Mech sent two employees out to California to talk to Jobs and Wozniak. Mech and Apple both envisioned a future where computers would be an integral part of everyone's lives, including education. Apple, eager to grow its user base, offered a great deal on five Apple II machines to Mech. Mech used these apples to demonstrate the latest and greatest technology from sunny California. Ooh, let me guess what happened next. Everyone loved it, they bought a hundred Apple IIs, and everyone lived happily ever after. Actually, a lot of the teachers in Minnesota were eager to get their hands on a completely different machine. The Radio Shack TRS-80. What? The Radio Shack TRS-80? How dare they? The fiends, the scoundrels! The TRS-80, also introduced in 1977, was a computer with the built-in Zilog Z80 processor, a built-in basic interpreter, and a monochrome video monitor, and even a cassette tape drive, all for only $600. Hmm, I suppose Radio Shack was driving a hard bargain. Then again, Lanio Schmack didn't have 16 lovely colors to display like an Apple II. So what did Mac end up doing? Well, since MEC was a state organization, the only legal way for them to make a purchase was to go through a bidding process. A bidding process? A eBay? Hmm, sort of. MEC contacted several companies to see which would offer the best deal to become the computer of Minnesotan schools. Among these companies were Apple, Candy Radio Shack, Atari, and Commodore all whom were competing for the home market at the time. While a bidding process wasn't a new concept, many of the computer companies didn't see Minnesotan schools as highly profitable. Companies like Tandy Radio Shack didn't even bother submitting a bid to Mech, thinking that the state's requirements were just unnecessary. So Tandy was just lazy? <gasps> oh no, did the Steve submit a bid? Well, they did, and just in the nick of time, too. Toward the end of Mech's bid window, Apple sent a rush courier to the Mech office and delivered a handwritten bid signed by Jobs and Wozniak themselves. The Apple II not only met mech specifications, but the price is more competitive than Atari's and Commodore's. Mech did not hesitate to accept Apple's offer and purchased 500 Apple II machines to distribute through schools all through the state of Minnesota. Holy pozzoli! 500 Apple IIs? Wow, that's a lot of Apple. Mech was just Johnny Apple's here from Minnesota, huh? Many schools saw the Apple II as a quantum step forward in technology. Teachers and students were no longer tied to the teletype machines, time slots, and horrible lag times they saw while using the mainframe. Now they had all the power of the Apple II instantly available at their fingertips. By 1980, Mech became the largest third-party seller of Apple computers in the world giving Apple their start in the educational computer business a few years before the Kids Can't Wait program. If you'd like to know more about Apple's Kids Can't Wait program, 
be sure to check out the first part of our Apple in School series. Wait a second, Miss Fox. Something doesn't add up. You said that Nick developed all this wonderful courseware for their Teletech systems. They didn't have to start over from scratch, did they? Next Teletech software library, written in BASIC, was easily converted to Apple BASIC, making the switch from the mainframe software to the Apple II relatively seamless. Well, wasn't that convenient? BASIC and BASIC. Thanks to the graphic abilities of the Apple II, Mech expanded their software to include color and interactive images. This is also when two of the most famous titles were developed, Number Munchers and Oregon Trail. So many games, so much learning. So, uh, I'm not from Minnesota, but I still had Mech games and software when I was in the classroom. How did that happen? Well, Mackie, word spread about Mech's educational software. Educators throughout the country knew that they could use software to teach their lesson plans. Mech's courseware not only provided an excellent library of software for the Apple II, but offered teachers complete lesson plans that integrated computers and technology into a myriad of subjects. Oh, wow! That must have been really useful back then. Can you imagine learning how to use a computer if you've never seen one before? Also, those binders are really neat. It must have been quite a culture shock to a lot of them. Thankfully, all of Mech's products had already been refined in the Minnesota school systems, and they knew the best ways to get teachers what they needed. At least that's what they wanted to happen. You see, there was a little problem that hadn't been addressed yet. Because Mech was technically owned by the state and taxpayers in Minnesota, there was no framework for selling or distributing goods outside of the state. Working hard for the money. Working hard. Mac had to quickly develop a licensing system that would not only provide a way for schools across the country to purchase software, but wouldn't rip off the taxpayers of Minnesota. And so, the Mac membership program was developed in 1980. This program allowed schools to pay for a site license for Mac software. The site license allowed the school to copy a disk of courseware as many times as it needed. So Mech actually wanted them to copy that floppy. <laughs> they did. In fact, schools throughout the country saw site licensing as the perfect way to integrate computers into their curriculum. Mech licensed the software to schools all across the country. With the system established, the Apple II became the Mech computer. Mech would later spin off into its own company and would no longer be a state entity. This allowed them to expand their software development to the Macintosh and even the PC. So that's how Apples got into schools. Well, at least the Apple IIs. I knew old Tui and Jesse from school in the 90s. The Apple II seemed to still be going strong then. Actually, about 75% of elementary schools in 1993 were still using the Apple II line of computers and the entire Mac software library with them. The Mech played a massive role in the popularity of the Apple II. Without a doubt, it was the go-to computer for elementary classrooms throughout the United States. The simplicity of the Apple II, combined with well-packaged Mech courseware, led to a winning combination for both companies through the 80s and 90s. After all this talk about Mech, I have a hankering for some trail riding. Can I, uh, play some games now? You sure can, Mackie. Thanks for watching our second part of our Apple in Schools series. In the next episode, we'll be covering the computer programming language, Logo. <gasps> Logo? You mean the one where the turtle draws lines on the screen? That one was fun. That's the one, Mackie. We know We hope to see you back soon. Bye. Adios, muchachos.